Welcome to the Open Mic Podcast Show with Mike Midgley. Hey, and welcome to the Open Mic Podcast today. On today's episode, I'm excited to be learning more about entrepreneurship the Barefoot Spirit way. Today's influencer guests are Bonnie Harvey and Michael Hulam, the co-founders of Barefoot Spirit, based out of Forestville, California. You guys who are listening, you may also know them as the original co-founders of the Barefoot Wine Brand, which is the largest wine brand in the world. Welcome to the show, Bonnie. Welcome to the show, Michael. It's an absolute pleasure to have you today. Thank you so much, Mike. We are really delighted to be here. Yeah, great to be here, Mike. <laughs> Absolutely great. It, it, it's such an honor to have you on, and we're so appreciative of the time. You know, when we listen, uh, our listeners on the podcast, um, you know, the show's all about entrepreneurship, uh, bridging the gap between idea and imp- successful implementation and high growth and things like that. And the story and the journey that you guys have gone on is, is absolutely, you know, just phenomenal. Um, and we're going to learn a little bit more about this as we go through the show, guys. Um, so, you know, before we get started, if you want to check out the amazing work that Bonnie and Michael are doing, uh, we're going to put all the links in the show notes below, uh, but you can check them out, like such as on Twitter at barefoot underscore spirits. Um, you can check out the barefootspirit.com as website. Uh, there's all the usual. We'll put Michael and Bonnie's LinkedIn, Instagram, uh, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, uh, there. Or you can search the hashtag the barefoot spirit. Um, so as we get started today, uh, the journey um, that you guys have actually been on, we're going to share a little bit more about this. And this is going to be a fairly unique podcast for the regular listeners to the fact that we're going to also dip in and out of Bonnie and Michael's latest project, which is audio theater and things like that. Um, and we're going to play some clips live, well, not live, but in the recording as well, just to sort of demonstrate this. And that's going to sort of hopefully put a lot more color on the recording and the listening. Now, if you want to watch this show, head over to blog.thesuccessof.io forward slash podcasts. Uh, You're going to be able to see Michael and Bonnie on there, um, as well as we're going to put the clips in there so you'll be able to play them back on there absolutely phenomenal and this is an absolute must uh, listen podcast so as i say for those who are not familiar uh, with the original origins um you know barefoot wine uh, tell us a little bit more about how you become you know i suppose that number one sort of wine brand when you first started um i know now obviously it's keynote speakers new york times best-selling authors and we've got a couple of books out there the barefoot spirit how, you know how, you know how hardship hustle you know you know and heart built america's number one wine brand and then the second book is the entrepreneurial culture 23 ways to engage and empower your people um we will put both those links to um, the Amazon stores and such on the show notes as well. So from humble beginnings, really from a laundry room all the way through to a, a, in a farmhouse, through to the boardroom of you know, the world's largest wine company, um, you've learned some crucial and valuable lessons. You just tell us a little bit about that, guys, and, and just a little bit about that bio and that backstory. We'd love you to share that with our listeners. Well, what we did is we really had an opportunity that we couldn't pass up. A lot of people say, follow your passion, and that's a wonderful thing to do, but you've got to make some money along the way to pay the bills. (laughs) So we had an opportunity uh, that was $300,000 that my client was unable to collect for the grapes that he had given a uh, winery. So I asked my new boyfriend at the time, (laughs) to go collect $300,000. Yeah, and that was, like, I just met this cow. <laughs> and uh, now she's got me out trying to lean on somebody for 300 large. I wondered, where is this relationship going? You know? Oh, dear. And so, um, so I go to this winery, and when I get there, the guard stops me, and he says, I hope you're not here to collect any money because we just <laughs> declared bankruptcy this morning. He says, so you can take your ticket and wait your turn. And I went, oh, no, you know, now what am I going to do? So I went through the meeting, and at the meeting, I'm looking out the window, and, I've got, and I'm dealing with the board of directors of the company, which is now all the secured stockholders. My guy doesn't have any security at all. He doesn't even have a contract. I look out the window, and I see all these stainless steel tanks gleaming in the sun. So I try to make some small talk, and I say, well, what do you guys got in those tanks? And they said, oh, we got Cabernet Sauvignon and Sauvignon Blanc wine, 
in bulk. I went, oh, that, thinking to myself, that's interesting because those are the same two varietals you owe my client for. Um, and so then I look out the other window and I see what looks like a chrome locomotive in a handball court. And I'm making small talk and trying to be cute. And I say, well, what's with the chrome locomotive in the handball court? They said, oh, well, that's not a chrome locomotive. That's a bottling line from Germany and it's a clean room. It's not a handball court. And that's a bottling <laughs> Yeah, a bottling room. Yeah, so I said, well, okay. It hit me like, you know, a chrome locomotive. And I said, <laughs> look, you guys can't pay me any money, but what do you say we take some of that wine from those tanks over there, run it through your chrome locomotive, and you pay <laughs> us in, in bottled wine? You know, we'll, we'll find a label, you know, we'll come up with a program. You know, how hard could that be? How long could that take? <laughs> Little did you know. <laughs> so, so that's that's how Barefoot gets started on a debt. Amazing. And some of these, you know, for the listeners in, in uh, you know, in entrepreneurship, sometimes the, you know, the craziest opportunities and some of the most, you know, successful businesses never started out that way. I mean, back in 1993, I started with BMW. Uh, BMW is synonymous now for motor cars. But ultimately, if you look at the BMW badge, um, it's a white propeller on the blue Bavarian sky. And that's what it is. And BMW started out as an airplane manufacturer, um, you know, and airplanes. And, but, you know, obviously, there's a reason why they went into cars, but I'm just saying it's not always what you think. And, you know, how did the large, world's largest wine brand become, you know, a, wow, an amazing story. And uh, tell me, Bonnie, uh, you sent him out to collect there. How did he come back? Did he come back with a crazy idea or, you know, did, were you happy with it? Or I'm sure you'd rather have the 300 large, as Michael says, but uh, ultimately. Exactly. Uh, were you nervous about it? He, he comes back and he's kind of dancing around. He said, yeah. He said, I think, I, I think I've got it here. He says, you know, we've got bulk wine and bottling services. And I said, well, that's not going to pay any bills. Now we've got to come up with all the licenses, with the bottle design, the label design. And hey, how about a market? Where are we going to sell it? You know, we thought, well, we'll just sell it all in the chains. Bottle it up, sell it to the chains. Amazing. Um, but as you'll see a little later, you know, uh, ignorance is bliss. If we hadn't started, really, if we hadn't started with our two greatest assets, which were no knowledge of the wine industry yep. and no money, Barefoot wouldn't be in your fridge today. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Those, those turned out to be big assets for us. They are, and I hear it a lot when I sit in boardrooms and I work with entrepreneurs. I look at it, and you know, sometimes you can overthink things. You can be too specialist in things, and and sometimes that holds you back. Sometimes, and you know, sometimes you know, like you guys, you, you seize the opportunity. You know, not in that business at all. Um, and you know, this is not a this is not a secret. It's neither public knowledge to a degree, although it will be when this goes out. We're actually looking at a McDonald's franchise at the moment. We're actually looking at investing. We're going to the McDonald's um, uh, Open Day in October. October in Leeds in the UK um, and I have no restaurant experience but I got a bucket load of uh, business and investment experience and, and you know whether you like or hate McDonald's for whatever reason um, it knows how to print dollars you know a little bit like Disney to a degree and uh, that's an opportunity then and, and you know so I get it and I'm excited about that because I know nothing about the restaurant industry but I do mm -hmm. understand business models and, and things like that so I get it and it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a charming story it's amazing and you know to say you know it, it reach the heights that it, it, it did and continues to do is, is absolutely testament. Well done. So, you know, we talk about entrepreneurship a little bit more, guys. And, and when I look at your bio now, you're consulting and you're training with Fortune 500 companies on brand building and company cultures and things like that today, um, you know, as well as what you're doing in the Barefoot Spirit. Um, what do you see? And I mean, this is slightly off script, guys. I apologize to put you on the spot. But um, what do you see as the crucial mistakes that companies are making around brand building and company culture at the moment. Would you say there's some major uh, mistakes or well, do you think it's just the slightly out of a line or they've not got it connected? You know, what would you see? When companies thing? are starting off, they think that they have such a wonderful product or service that everyone's going to just rush right to their door and buy it. Yeah. And they get very involved in the production end and in the design yeah. and um, when they do that, before they understand what the market needs, 
they really set themselves up for failure. Yeah. So I think the biggest mistake is falling in love with your own product or service <laughs> and getting very involved in time, energy, and money in the production of such without taking a closer look at the market and yeah. what the needs are of everyone along the, the uh, chain of distribution because yeah. by not satisfying their needs, maybe it's the package or the labeling right. or anything at all. Everyone's got a different need. They, they really hurt themselves. So I, I love what you said, Bonnie, there. Good research before you design your package. Brilliant. I love your point there, Bonnie, as well about uh, people fall in love and they get too emotionally attached with the product, and you know, you know, and, and they sometimes get offended, don't they, when you say, "Well, hey, that's there's maybe not a product market fit there, or or whatever it may be." Uh, and yeah, I get it, and, and you know, it's a big mistake. I see it a lot, that you know, and uh, thanks for sharing on that one. Um, Today, Bonnie and Michael are highly commended um, by companies seeking to increase the sales, engage, and empower and inspire the people. Um, Bonnie and Michael are regular contributors to uh, business journals in 43 cities nationwide, entrepreneur, uh, the contributor articles and interviews, Inc. Magazine, CEO Forum, Forbes, and other major business publications, um, you know, to share the stories, regular, you know, media on TV, radio, uh, podcasts like this, which, um, you know, from there. Uh, and one thing I just want to sort of push back on that sort of part, guys, for the audience, for the, for the young entrepreneurs and, and maybe for the ones who are just maybe just trying to get it clicked later in life as well. Tell us a little bit more about your media exposure and how you manage your, what I, what, what I call an omni-channel, a multi-channel content strategy. You know, you're across TV, radio, online, contributing articles. You know, I speak to some clients when I work with, from a son's agency and they'll say, oh, I'm struggling to produce a blog post a week. But, you know, when you're doing such much omni-channel, you know, is there a secret to that? Is there any tips or guidance you could sort of uh, give the entrepreneurs who are listening today about you know managing so many commitments and so many different mediums that require different you know visual or copy or auditory and production and things like that it must be one heck of a schedule well we definitely uh prepare and i yeah. think you know somebody really wise once said uh for every 15 minutes of stellar performance there's two hours of preparation yeah. So uh, we get to know who our host is, uh, who his audience is. Uh, when we do uh, our, our professional speaking, for instance, uh, we ask a lot of questions. Yeah. You know, who is your audience? How many males? How many females? Uh, what kind of businesses are they in? Are they production businesses? Are they service businesses? Uh, you know, are they CEOs or are they founders? Yeah. Uh, all this makes a big difference. Uh, we have a plethora of tools that we can give them that they can leave with. Yeah. But we want to make sure that we're giving them the right wrench, you know, that turns the right nut. Absolutely. Brilliant. No, I love it. Absolutely love it. And, you know, as you look at it today, you know, about, you know, your style really, guys, and I've had the pleasure of spending, you know, 10 or so minutes prior to the recording today chatting with you. And it's just infectious. And, you know, the way you present fresh, it's authentic, it's fun, it entertains, educates, motivates. You know, you, you're doing soft skills, you know, earn hard cash topics, two division company topics, which we're going to touch on later on. Uh, you know, the straight up fastest way out of the box topic. Find good people, build great people. Um, you know, this is me. This is me learning from you. I apologize. I'm abusing the listener's time here. But, you know, how do you come up with those? Are they, are they just things that every business uh, needs to do, do you think? Or, you know, oh, does it depend on yes. sectors? Talk to me a little bit more about that. Well, we spent 20 years growing the Barefoot brand. Yeah. And we learned so many lessons during that period of time. And they were hard lessons. They, they took a lot of time. They took money. And there was a lot of stress involved. Yeah. And what really motivates us to get the word out now about those lessons is we want other people to succeed without having to go through that much pain yeah. and suffering. So that's why we've written it all down. We've written about 600 articles in the past several years. And as you say, we've been on a lot of broadcast stations, podcasts, etc. And we want to reach out to the greatest number of people. So we do it in a lot of different formats and we try a lot of different ways so we can really reach out and 
help other people succeed. Yeah. So maybe instead of taking 20 years that it took us, it'll just take you half that long. <laughs> yeah, and shortcut it. And I know what you mean. I've walked a million miles in a lot of issues, startups, um, exits, uh, a failure. We lost a business administration. We've had a couple of good successful exits. We floated on the UK stock market in one of my businesses. And, you know, people just see the iceberg and the tip, don't they? Oh, that's successful and great. They don't see all, you know, like the duck's feet paddling like mad underneath and all the stress <laughs> of the yes. sleepless nights. And, you know, it may not be the biggest sum of money in the scheme of the barefoot wine um, sort of, you know, empire and what you do with the barefoot spirit and things like that now. But I remember back in 2004, we just gone through a real turbulent time, uh, and we couldn't make payroll. We could not make payroll. We'd got a great forward order bank, but we couldn't make it. And I came home, and we have about three weeks to payroll, and I'm thinking, we're going to have a real pinch point here. And I speak to this down with my finance director, and she says, Mike, we're 20 grand short, so, you know, 20,000 pounds. At the time, the dollar rate was about $1.80, so it's about 35, 38,000 dollars short. So what did I do? I came home and I said to my wife, hey, I'm going to have to apply for as many credit cards as I can because I know we're going to make this, but we're not going to make it if I don't do this. And luckily, we got a 25 grand sterling limit on a credit card. And I remember about 10 days later when the card came through with post guys, I drove to work. I gave Melanie my FD the card. I says, run that through the machine. And I drove home that day, 25,000 pound UK sterling, so about $38,000 in debt, just so we could cover the payroll at about eight days time or whatever. Um, and then people That's don't... the good news and the bad news, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But then obviously the, the, the order book did come in and we managed to pay it off. But, you know, we, people don't always see those gambles and those, you know, was it a gamble? Was it a calculated risk? You know, maybe there's a bit of both in there. But, but people don't always see that, do they? And they've never walked that mile in the shoes. And um, so I'm super pleased that you're writing this down and you're educating and getting that out there. And, and you can, you know, you, you know, you're sharing those because yes. I try and do that to help people as well yes we talk about our mistakes whenever we're talking to other people we tell them the popularly held misconceptions that people react to that they respond in that and you we really learn to, to look at a bigger picture instead of just following things that uh, other people had done before us yeah. so that's part of you know looking at the big picture the fastest way out of the box is 20,000 feet up, straight up. Wow. Amazing. And um, that's why we share our stories is because they're not just lessons, they're stories of how we learned them, how we made the mistakes, and then what we did to make those mistakes right. Yep. Uh, we say never waste a perfectly good mistake. Okay? <laughs> Something to learn from. <laughs> yeah. And, and we love to use humor because people will listen to humor. And that's why our stories are always humorous. They're true. And they're about the lessons that we learned that any business can apply and will, they will benefit from. Amazing. Yeah, it's great. And uh, you're right, the authenticity of being open, it's not all success. It is a big draw for people, especially in 2019. You know, the, the see-through, the fakeness and things like that, and the want the, the, want the warts and all, I believe. So, uh, so to learn more about what Bonnie and Michael are up to today, the latest project is barefootaudiobook.com. Yes. Um, it's a new audio book and it's presented in theatrical format with Hollywood actors uh, playing the parts uh, like original music scores, sound effects, plus much, much more. There's no way, guys, I could do it justice. Obviously, we're going to play some clips, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, later on. Um, but just tell us a little bit more. I suppose I've got two questions, slightly off script, and again, I apologize, but it's so dynamic, this interview with you guys, um, it, as, as things are coming up in my head. Uh, I'm slightly off script here from where I would be, but what was the original sort of, you know, uh, think tank or thought process about moving into this next venture? Um, and why did you decide to do it in the format that you did it in? I'd just love to sort of get your ideas on that. So, uh, you know, we're, we're big on what now they call crowdsourcing. Yep. Uh, and so, you know, we were giving talks to 60 universities around the world um, and to major organizations like the World Conference on Entrepreneurship. And as time went on, we noticed that more and more people were showing up with earbuds. Yep. And especially the young people. 
And so we asked a stupid question like, you know, well, what are you listening to? Is it rock and roll? Is it hip hop? Is it rap? What are you listening to? And you guys say, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm listening to War and Peace. Or a, a woman would say, no, I'm listening to a podcast on how to start your own business. And we went, oh, that's interesting. Now, the elephant in the room, of course, is that podcasts are free. So yeah. it, it does appeal to the 24 through 44-year-old crowd. Uh, but, the, but the good news is that it doesn't, unlike script and unlike uh, video, it doesn't immobilize your mobile device. In other words, you can jog, you can drive, you can do things uh, and multitask while yeah. you're being educated. And you can also shut it off and take it in small bursts. So, you know, if you're on the bus, you, you can listen to it on the bus and shut it off. And so... We, we thought, well, you know, an audio book is a great way to get our story across. But then we, start, we went out and we started listening to audio books. And, you know, they were single dimensional. They typically so. were being read to you by a narrator. Yep. And, um, and, you know, this can be droning after a while. It can be, uh, you know, single dimensional. And so we thought, you know, and, and then we started listening to some, you know, really interesting stuff on the BBC, uh, with these afternoon uh, skits that were like right out of the 1940s, you know, <laughs> before television, where they were building a television screen in your head by driving the scene, bringing in the actors, building the characters up, using sound effects and musical score. And we said, you know, maybe that's it. Maybe what we need to do is just say, okay, you guys want entertainment? We're gonna give you entertainment. It'll be infotainment, but it'll be entertaining. And what we'll do is we'll give you these skits that are in short bursts, and there'll be this thread of truth that weaves its way through everyone. And you'll be able to see, you know, people uh, who are characters, their mindset, the action they take, and then the outcome. And then by witnessing that, you'll grab this business principle probably better than you would if somebody just read it to you. Yeah. So that was the spark right there. Thank you, BBC. Yeah, yeah. and it's like, it's like we were speaking about it before we started the show. It's about the three-part play, and that's how I always imagine it, the beginning, the middle, and the end. But it's got so much depth and character and dimension. Like you say, the audio books that we see today, some, you know, I think the better ones are the ones where the, the authors actually read them more than having what I would call an actor do it when it's such one dimensional. But the way you've brought those actors in, Bonnie, um, you've brought that multi-layer, it's, it's like 3D listening. When I was listening to the sample clips when I was doing my research, you know, and I said to the entire team here, you have to listen to these clips. And I said, they're all maybe out of sync as a fact of, you know, what you're doing today. And, you know, because I'm immersed in your research before I did the show. Uh, but I said, you must listen to these clips. They're just phenomenal. And, you know, it, 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 they're, they're like three-dimensional listening. And it's, it, you know, what's the, you know, obviously that's the spark to do it. Um, talk to us a little bit more about how you layered it in and you're choosing the actors and the scores. What's the process to even bring that together? Because it's so unique. It's amazing. We'd already written The Barefoot Spirit, How Hardship, Hustle, and Heart yeah. Built America's Number One Wine Brand. Yeah. That was in a paperback. It became a New York Times bestseller. Now, that book is filled with stories, real stories, about how Michael and I learned our lessons the hard way. <laughs> and it has a lot of dialogue in it. And it has, it's just filled with humor. It's very well written. So we already had that as a basis. And uh, we met a troupe in Southern California in Hollywood, and they had been working together for some time. And it had actors, it had sound people techs, uh, and it had a, a, a production manager, and it had a woman who had done narration that had an excellent, excellent voice. And so once we'd met them with this idea in mind that we wanted to reach more people with our story and we felt that an audio book would do it, it just kind of all kind of melted together. Yeah, and uh, it just seemed like the perfect thing to do. And once it was complete, we were really happy. It was everything that we were looking for. It really had that excitement. It has the humor. It's got the great acting, sound effects, 
We added sound effects, original music score. So it's got everything. You'll be entertained and educated at the same time. That's it. And you, and you can find out more at Barefoot Audio, uh, sorry, barefootaudiobook.com as well, which we'll put the yes. link in the show. Um, but Bonnie, Michael, the journey and the value you provide already is immense. Thank you so much. Um, and before we get to sort of start about, you know, entrepreneurship the Barefoot Spirit way, I did say earlier on we're going to do a, a podcast with a slight difference here. Um, and what we're actually going to do, we're going to play a clip. Um, which is what we call the no game uh, clip. Um, and, you know, for all entrepreneurs out there, um, you know, Bonnie touched on it earlier about product demand and things like that. A lot of people are struggling to understand what the customers want. Um, so what we're going to do now, we're just going to play this uh, little clip here, and this is going to give you a little bit of a feel for it. And it's called the no game clip. So let's take a listen to this and uh, see how we go here. The no game was straightforward. Just keep trying until you get a yes. Lots of times, they cheerfully attacked getting told no as if it were a puzzle to solve. This came just as much from lessons Michael and Bonnie learned in their lives as from business experience. There was, for instance, a dinner with Mabel in the early 1990s at a Mexican restaurant in Santa Rosa. Mabel couldn't get the server to take her order. I'd like to have the vegetable fajitas, please. I'm sorry, ma'am. We only serve beef, chicken, or shrimp. Are you sure you can't make an exception this time? I'll even pay a little extra. I'm sorry, ma'am. I wish I could. Fajitas, of course, are usually grilled meat, chicken, or seafood on a tortilla with loads of onions and peppers. Okay, then. I'll have a chicken fajita. Hold the chicken. No problem. That's the no game. Figure there's always an answer. Just keep playing. So there you go. So that's the no game clip. And it, it's, it's pretty interesting, really. Sorry, let me just put my screen back, guys. Uh, it's pretty interesting about how you've positioned that. And just tell us a little bit more about how that script came about because it's fascinating about the server is, you know, is processed out there, but the, but the, the lady, she's, you know, desperate to get a, vegeta a vegetarian option. Uh, and, and as soon as she mentions it, the guy goes, yeah, no problem, it's on its way. Uh, and it's amazing. So tell, tell us a little bit more about that and why well, it's so we important. I learned that if you keep getting no's, the best thing to do is ask a different day, ask a different way, or ask a different person. <laughs> and in this last clip, it was asking a different way. And you see how effective that was. Amazing. So really, the only way you can lose the no game is if you say no to yourself and you stop asking. Yeah. But we found that the average number of no's was seven. Wow. So you can't even start complaining about it until you reach those seven no's. And anything after seven means you're getting closer to yes. So yay, you know, you can be excited. Hey, I've got nine no's so far. I know that I'm close to getting a yes. And, and this is this is really this is really part of you know the fun and the team building that's yes. you know part and parcel of what we call the barefoot spirit, Absolutely. which is here we are we're making a game we're having fun with adversity. Now anybody yes. who started a business knows that they deal with adversity all day long. They get told no all day long. So why not make a game out of it, you know, and be lighthearted about it. Uh, you know, I mean, for a while, we asked people to start keeping track of how often they got told no <laughs> before they got to yes. And that's how we came up with the average number of seven. Amazing, isn't it? Amazing. But I love the clip. And, and um, I was saying to the guys yesterday here, you know, I'll have a chicken burrito, but hold on the chicken. And it's just, just a, a feed, I should say, but amazing, fantastic. So as we sort of dip, dip into uh, entrepreneurship, the, the Barefoot Spirit way, and again, we're going to play some more of these clips, guys. So bear with us um, as we go along. They're just so amazing. Um, before we start, entrepreneurship, startup, monetization, challenges and solutions. I know we've touched on a few things that, in, in, in the bios and some of the things that you guys come across. Um, but just tell us a little bit more about, you know, the startup and monetization, the challenges and solutions. Just tell us a little bit more about that and the journey that you've had uh, throughout, you know, your barefoot okay. journey. So all businesses go through four phases. They go through the startup, the build up, the build out and the enterprise. Yeah. Now in the startup phase, 
you don't know whether you're going to make it or not. I mean, you're just operating on investor's money or you're running out your credit card, right? <laughs> so you've got to make sales. And so that's when you get to build up and build up. You're actually making sales, but sales has a danger too, because now you're selling to one or two clients and they've got you over the barrel. Yeah. They can negotiate with you because they know they're your only one or two clients. So you've got to be very careful. So then you go to build out. You say, you know, we need more big clients so we're not held hostage. And that's where another danger comes in because now you've spread yourself and you could spread yourself too thin. The yeah. biggest problem that companies have is not the cost of goods, it's the cost of sales. Yes. They don't realize how much it's going to cost them to service what they've sold. So many companies, they expand too fast. And so that's what the build-out problem is. And then enterprise. Enterprise, they get through the startup, they get through the build-up, they get through the build-out, they become an enterprise. But what happens is the doldrums start to set in. They start to get into divisions of labor. They start to get into siloing. The guy in engineering says, oh, yeah, my company failed, but, you know, that was the sales guy's problem. I had nothing to do with sales, right? Um, you know, try to isolate and insulate themselves yeah. from the sales process. Oh, I'm uh, an accountant or, you know, I'm doing this or that. Uh, it's interesting. The marketing guys will always take a bow when sales are up and point their <laughs> finger at salespeople when the sales are down. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, I know we do it in our agency. We, we talk about the, the, you know, the marketing sales handoff and that closed loop where marketing actually gets a target, sales gets a target, and it loops around and they're both accountable to each other. Uh, and it's a great way of doing it. But ultimately, I, you know, it's like having that business development strategy that's essential and they miss out on it, don't they? You know, it's a crazy, crazy world. Uh, but no, thank you for covering that. Um, uh, from, from there. <laughs> the barefoot story, um, before we play the next clip, um, let's just sort of position this right. So for the, the, the listeners who are maybe listening uh, on the apps and not watching it on the blog, uh, the Barefoot Story, share your journey, you know, what we call from the laundry room to the boardroom, and just sort of give us a little bit of a teaser before we go into the clip, and then we'll talk a little bit more about that. Just tell us a little bit more for, around that. Now, that, would that clip be the first buyer? Uh, that would be uh, the birth of the foot. Oh, the birth of the foot. Yeah. <laughs> we, we had, by this time, we had our bottling services. We had our bulk wine. Yep. We needed a label. Yeah. What's the label going to look like? So we went out and we asked a lot of people what they knew about label design. We asked the clerks in the store what sold the best, what labels were, were selling the best. And we asked the bottling line man what he <laughs> knew about, you know, the bottling of labels and how they reacted on the line. Um, and he, we got information from a lot of people the bottling line manager told us that we had to be careful about having something on the label that was too fancy that people couldn't read or something that was too dark that would, you know, kind of recede on the shelf. Yep. So he showed us the labels that he would bottled the most of, presumably because they sold, <laughs> and the ones he bottled the least of. So that gave us a little hint about what the label should look like. And we asked the guy at the supermarket, and he said, well, we, we need labels that are going to jump off the shelf that can be seen from four feet away. So we took that into account. And there were various other people that we talked to, and we took it all into account. And uh, We say, you've got to make friends in low places <laughs> if you want to yeah. succeed. People with dirt under their fingernails. Yeah, the, the people who do the real job, you know, not just the white collar guys or the people that graduate from Oxford or Stanford. Yeah. You've got to talk to people that are doing On the, the ground. And, and they will give you some insight about your industry that those guys on top have never thought about. Yeah. They're not close enough to And you. we were told to make the name the same as the logo. Yep. And make it in plain English. Make it... Uh, memorable. We took all of these ideas along with the other ones we'd gotten and just tried to figure out what kind of a label we could produce that would have all these qualities that would sell very well. And because uh, 
grapes were originally crushed barefoot to make wine, we thought, well, barefoot is a good name and a good image that we could use, but still we didn't have the design of the label. It just, it fits some of the qualifications. So after a late night dinner. Well, we're right up to the clip. Let's run the clip. Let's introduce the clip and let's see how that plays out, the birth of the foot. She needed to make it solid. She needed Michael to draw it. And she needed this to happen fast. That's why she was almost vibrating to get it out and why she hustled a half-asleep Michael to the little green chalkboard in the kitchen. I know what the label looks like. This is going to be a big success. I could see it stacked in supermarkets. This is going to sell a lot of wine. Michael picked up the chalk and started to draw. Quick, quick, draw a foot. What kind of foot? A nice foot. Just draw it. Michael sketched a slim right foot along the bottom of the chalkboard. No, 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 stand it up. He erased it and drew one with the heel at the bottom and the toes straight up. Close, tilt it to the right. He erased and drew again. No, no, more tilt, just a little. Make it look like there's some motion. It's like someone is stepping up. Bonnie's voice was getting louder. She was talking faster, feeling like this was even more urgent. Her panic was growing. They could not lose this idea. Is that it? By now, the chalkboard had a layer of white dust from all the erased chalk. Really close. The foot should look like an exclamation point, an italicized exclamation point. And give it a little more arch. It got more tilt. It got more arch. How's that? Now right barefoot. Michael put down barefoot next to the angled drawing. Closer. Move it closer. Put the T all the way inside the arch. Bonnie stopped bouncing and looked at it. The board was nearly white. The air was filled with chalk dust. They stood silently, surrounded by their intensity. Both were taking big breaths. <sighs> Bonnie's fear had dissipated. They looked at a slim right foot pointing up at a two o'clock angle, acting as an exclamation point for the barefoot written into the arch. They both thought it was good, but they had no idea that in not much more than a decade, it would become an iconic national label. <sighs> there, that's what the label looks like. That's gonna sell a lot of wine. So guys, the birth of the foot, and I'm not sure if the listeners heard that, but when we talked about, when I use the terminology, I'm not sure if it's right, guys, but I call it like three-dimensional audio. I'm not sure you could hear the, the scrubbing of the board at the end and the chalk on the board as, as Bonnie was sort of, I don't know if it was barking instructions, but it was excitement fueling that sort of creation. But that's what I'm saying. You've got the music playing in there, the different octaves playing in there. You've got the multi-actors in there. You can even hear the scrubbing of the chalk. If you haven't, hit the rewind button, hit it 20, 40 seconds uh, from the show and go back and listen to that clip. It is absolutely outstanding. Congratulations, guys. And that's the detail that I picked up when I did it in my research. I think it was phenomenal, uh, an amazing effort. Thank and, you. Uh, I absolutely love it. That's exactly that. how it happened. Yeah, but, it, but it, it's great. But it's how you've brought that to life, I think, is right. what is new and so refreshing. And it's, it's amazing. So um, I, I get a big smile on my face when I hear that again. We wanted, to, we wanted uh, entrepreneurs and, and entrepreneurs to appreciate the fact that, you know, you do a lot of research and you get all these parts and you think about it. And then at the craziest time, maybe it's at the end of the night or maybe you're in the shower, you wake up in the morning, you're brushing your teeth and bam, oh my God, there it is. See, and all the pieces come together. And, you, you know, as an entrepreneur, you have to kind of rely on this super consciousness that, you, that all of us humans have mm -hmm. to, to give you those insights. You know, uh, you know uh, Mozart said the music was coming so fast he couldn't <laughs> write it. See? Well, you know, and, uh, you know, pe people, uh, you know, like your Mick Jagger, you know, he says get the whole song in his head instantly. Yeah. So this is, this is the kind of thing that happens uh, if you will give your brain a chance to digest some of these things and give it the input that it needs. Collect all the parts. Absolutely. So we talk about uh, the need that everybody has to sort of get their product out there. Um, and that was no different for Barefoot Wine. You, you know, you, I suppose, repossessed some bottle in the equipment or, or liquid, and you've got the label there. And we're going to play another clip in a moment, which is the bias part two clip, Bonnie. 
um, in a moment. Uh, this is my favorite clip. This, this is my absolutely <laughs> favorite clip out of all. Um, I'll not sort of give too much out of the bag, but I'd just like you to sort of give us a, a build up to this. Um, and just tell us what this little clip's a little about uh, and how it related back to, obviously, you know, derived out of the Barefoot story. So, you know, we made our friends in low places. We learned all the lessons. We came up with the label. Uh, you know, uh, we, we did everything we were told to do. Uh, we were really proud of ourselves. And this sounds just like what we said at the beginning of our discussion today, which is the biggest mistake that startups make is that they fall in love with their product. Well, we yeah. were in love. We were <laughs> We, we knew that we had something we were very excited about. Uh, it was exactly what the uh, buyers asked for, and it satisfied all the requirements of the mechanics, the truck drivers, everybody that was involved in this industry. And so here we are, you know, going to present it, and we expect to just, you know, collect the money, and we're down the road, right? Uh, uh, it's a clean transaction. Uh, you know, we, we get our money, we can pay the debt, and we start our next business. That's what we think. See? <laughs> but as they say, but no. <laughs> Absolutely. So if you think about what Bonnie said earlier about that did all the market research, the spoke to people, four foot, you know, the, the label has to be seen from four foot, you know, so whether going down the aisle and something remember, name and, and logo the same and things like that. So just to sort of preamble this, guys, for the listeners, because I've had the benefit of uh, reading the stories, um, benefit of uh, listening to the cassettes. So we've, we've repossessed all this wine. We've got a bottling machine. We've got thousands of bottles of Cabernet Sauvignon and uh, various other sort of uh, uh, wines. We've got all this research. Uh, Michael's going in to close the deal back with the guy, and then guess what happens? So uh, let's just take a quick look and find out exactly what did happen uh, with the buyer. Yeah, who do I have? What do you want? Michael put a bottle of Barefoot Cabernet and one of the Sauvignon Blanc on Brown's desk. We bottled the wine and want you to see it. Brown picked up the bottle of red and looked it up and down. Then he did the same with the white. This is what you asked for. There aren't any leaps or hills or rivers. It's a label she can read from four feet away. The logo is the same as the name. It's in plain English and easy to pronounce. It's a name she'll remember and a logo she won't forget. Michael was proud of what they'd done in the way of a student with a good report card. Barefoot was unique, interesting, and fit everything that Brown and the others said would sell. The wine, he knew, was terrific. The label was friendly and fun. What's not to love, he thought. Brown kept looking at the bottles. He didn't say anything. The silence was uncomfortable, but Michael sat quietly. Brown looked at the bottles again, but said nothing. Michael figured it was just Don Brown being Don Brown, make everyone sweat. So, Don, how many truckloads do you want? Brown put the bottle down at his desk and looked at Michael like he was from Mars. Michael couldn't have gotten a worse look from Brown if he had clucked. Are you crazy? I can't buy this. Nobody knows this brand. Nobody's ever seen or heard of Barefoot. It's everything you asked for. Yeah? So what? That doesn't matter. No one's going to buy something they never heard of. You got to advertise it. If you're willing to spend $1 million on TV ads, I'll buy it from you. We don't have that kind of advertising budget. In truth, they had no advertising budget. There wasn't $100 for ads. Then you gotta go make a name for yourself. You gotta go sell it to every mom and pop store in every corner till everyone knows what Barefoot is. Michael felt like he just got hit by a brick. That'll take years. Well, Hulan, you better get started. Wow. <laughs> so you, do, you thought you'd done everything right, and then Don Brown comes in and then just says, spend a million bucks and um, we'll sell it. So then what did you do? Obviously, you mean, you know, like you said, I think you said, I think you said in the clip, you felt like you'd been hit by a truck. So what, what happened next, guys? Well, we understood his point. Now, why would he put a brand in there that nobody would heard of? So what we had to do is go out and make a name for ourselves, just like he said. And uh, Michael went into San Francisco, being close to us, being the largest market uh, nearby, and he started selling with the distributor sales representatives 
all the markets, um, the small corner family owned mom and pop markets in San Francisco. And they had the same concern. They said, nobody's ever heard of this. I don't want to get stuck with it. And uh, we were able to place it in what, 10 stores to start with, right, Michael? Mm -hmm. And uh, every month you get a report from your distributor that tells you how many cases were sold of your product to what stores. And so we were very keen on seeing these reports. So when the report came in after the first, first month, it was like an Easter egg hunt, <laughs> just zeros. All those accounts had actually reordered no wine. Oh. No reorder, then, no new sales. And we knew that we were gonna get discontinued and that would be the end of Barefoot. You know, nobody wants a non-starter. And this is what we tell people now is you've got to be hot right off the, out of the gate. Yeah. Well, we were very cold um, <laughs> and they were absolutely right. Nobody, nobody ever heard of barefoot. And it looked goofy at the time. You know, people put a foot on the label. What the heck? What were you thinking? Yeah, what were you thinking? <laughs> and so then we get a telephone call and it's this guy from Chinatown in San Francisco. He represents a neighborhood association. He says, oh, he says, uh, you guys at Barefoot, he says, you're a big successful winery up there. He says, we're trying to raise some money for a kids after school park. We need swings, we need slides, and we need a sandbox and a jungle gym. You know, how about $50,000? <laughs> I said, do you have the right phone number? You know, I don't even have one of those 50. And then I oh, thought about it for a geez. minute and I said, well, but I'll tell you what we will do. We have a lot of wine. We can't sell it. So I'll just give you some wine. You can use it for your fundraiser. Yes. Maybe to loosen some people up. They'll write a bigger check. <laughs> you can auction it off and you can, you know, get the money by a swing or a slide. And he said, okay, you know, we'd rather have the money. We didn't hear from him again. Yeah. But when we got a report at the end of the month, the sales in that neighborhood were through the roof. People had reordered two and three times. Mm -hmm. And we thought, that's amazing. I wonder if it would work in another neighborhood. So we tried it in another neighborhood, only this time we got a little smarter. We told the people in the neighborhood they could have the wine, but we also told them where we were for sale in the neighborhood. Yeah. Yes. And so then that happened. And then we decided, well, you know, this is working pretty good. Maybe we have discovered a way to make barefoot a household word. So we went neighborhood after neighborhood, city after city, region after region, state after state, and country after country using what we call worthy cause marketing, which was to engage the community and get the members of the nonprofits to buy our brand for social reasons, not for mercantile reasons, but for social Perfect. reasons because they saw that we were supporting their cause. Amazing. That's a great way. And, you know, just it's one hell of a task. And I know when you said in the clip that'll take years. Uh, give, yeah. us a give us a timeline there from, you know, the Don Brown to, you know, going state to state, uh, region to region, state to state, and, and targeting that. And uh, love the strategy around the social reasons. That's, that's, a, that's a real clever trick, that because, you know, sometimes the best product in the world isn't always, you know, you think it's going to go that way, but it can, you know, there's so many different ways you can, package, you know, channelize your, your products out there. And uh, that was a really smart move. But tell us the time frame that that sort of took, Michael, uh, Bonnie, just to get where you were at that point. Well, growing was definitely slow. Um, as we were able to supply these various small neighborhood stores in San Francisco, Michael made a point of going back in there and making sure that they were serviced properly, yeah. that they were getting all the point of sale material we had, that they didn't run out on the shelf. So by giving them the best service possible, we were able to grow further in those neighborhoods where we'd already made uh, a foothold, so yeah. to speak. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I, so, sorry. So that in itself was a big lesson that we had to manage those stores individually in order to grow. So we used that philosophy and opened more markets. And we were even e able to get a couple small two, three store chains uh, close to the beginning in that first year. Mm -hmm. But as far as going back to Lucky Stores, which were the largest buyers of wine, products in uh, the California region, and that's where Don Brown came in. Yeah. That, that was our goal, to sell it in the chains. 
Um, how long did that take, Michael? About uh, two and a half years. Wow. Yeah. So this is what you call the grind. You know? <laughs> the long uh, game. You hear about people saying, oh, scale fast, fail fast, you know, no. uh, all this stuff about, you know, zooming up. You know, it took us two or three years, but the reason that Barefoot is so powerful today is because we learned in that two or three years about how to apologize within driving distance of our house. Absolutely. For the mistakes Absolutely. that we made, you know, misdeliveries, the wrong pricing, uh, you know, invoicing problems, uh, all of this stuff. Some of it was mistakes made by our distributor, but, you know, everybody blames the brand for whatever happens along the chain. And so because we became very good at distribution management. Yes. That's what really set the tone for Barefoot's final victory was that we really understood how to go out and distribute a product uh, in a state, uh, in a nation. Yeah. And, and that's where we move into that two division company, sales and sales support, I suppose. You know, you mentioned there, and the question I've got is how far do you go? Um, but you mentioned there within a, in, in a specific area, you would send somebody out, you'd correct it, that customer service really took over. And we're going to play a clip here. Um, it's, it's my second favorite clip. I love, the be- I love the birth of the foot one, but Don Brown is my favorite one, like I said. Um, there's this grumpy old guy there. And I'm sure, I'm, I don't know if Don was actually grumpy or you know, you've actually modeled that, I don't know, but it's, it's a great character. Um, it, it's, all, it's almost as Don was going to let you down regardless. You, know, you, could, have, you could have absolutely nailed it, but he was going to let you down. Anyway, that's the character of the voice over there, and uh, you know the actor there is amazing. Who did that particular uh, voice? That's over. Ed Asner who plays yep. Don Brown. Yeah, Ed Asner, brilliant. Yeah, fantastic. And so, how far do you go? We're going to play a scene called the party scene in a moment or two. But just recap as we build up to that scene, at Bonnet Michael, about some of the things that you did again, so it's relevant so when they hear the clip. Well, we believed in putting ourselves in the other guy's shoes. And that was everybody that touched our product had anything to do with our product. So we were always trying to satisfy the needs of everyone. And that goes right to satisfying the needs of the customer, the end user. So we were really, uh, everyone in our staff paid attention to the needs of everyone we were doing business with. You know, with with Barefoot, uh, we were really building a movement that had a brand to go with it. Yes. yes. You know, yeah. uh, in America, we say, sell the sizzle and not the steak. The steak. <laughs> but what we say at the Barefoot Spirit is, you know, build the movement yeah. and the brand that goes with it. And so how do you build a brand uh, and you do it one person at a time? And that's what this clip is about. Brilliant. So let's take a listen uh, to the party scene uh, clip. And it's going to sort of demonstrate to you the levels that the guys went to and still do. If there was a barefooter in the area and state laws allowed it, Randy would send the barefooter to the house to make the delivery. Hi, I'm from Barefoot. I heard you got a bad cork. The people at the door would have their jaws hanging open. Here's another bottle. And here are a couple t-shirts. Have a nice evening. Oh, gee. Thanks. Some of the calls were so good, Randy would play them on the answering machine at Barefoot's office. My lovely wife and I are enjoying a nice glass of your cab. We're both barefoot. Not only that, we're both naked. Later, I'm going to drink some wine from her shoe. When he could, Randy called back quickly, though he generally steered clear of people drinking from their shoes. He picked up a message one Friday evening from a party in Chicago. The caller said they loved the wine and made everyone take their shoes off before they phoned. Randy called back. Hi, my name is Randy. I'm from Barefoot Wine. Woohoo! Everyone quiet! Hey, hey, quiet! The Barefoot guy's on the phone. The Barefoot guy. How good was that? A salesman returning a phone call got turned into a superhero. It also got him the permanent nickname, The Barefoot Guy. I just called to say, I'm glad to hear you're having a good time. Thanks for drinking Barefoot. Hey, everyone! He said, thanks for drinking Barefoot. People at that Chicago party started cheering. Randy could hear the whoops and yays. Oh, we love you, Barefoot! Yeah. The wine is great! We love your foot! That doesn't sound particularly groundbreaking in this current hyper-connected world when making personal connections is a mainstream business tactic, but it was new then. 
And it came from thinking the way any business needs to think. Amazing. So I think the key word there at the end for me, as I picked that up, is it's the way every business should think. And that personal connection, it builds on what you said, Michael, there about building one brand at a time. Um, and, you know, I suppose with the power of social media and social listening, now it gets a bit easier. But in the day, like you said, a salesperson calling back, uh, that should have, that's such a big impact. And people remember that, don't they? They remember that level of detail and personalization. And was that, was that a, obviously, it was a key strategy. But how did you manage it? How did you keep on top of it? And, and um, you know, I suppose, just tell us a little bit more around that because it's a major commitment. Well, for one thing, we had what we called barefooters. So these were brand dedicated representatives in every territory. And they were told to keep their people happy and to build their brand in their territory. So they would choose the nonprofits that they wanted to support. Yes. And they would have the relationships in that territory. Uh, many territories thought, for instance, that Barefoot was a brand from their territory. Yes. They didn't know that, you know, it was made in Northern California because perhaps uh, in Southern California, because we were supporting, say, the Surfrider Foundation uh, that was trying to clean the ocean and the beaches, and we were cooperating with them and clean beach movements and whatnot, they thought, well, these guys must be local to put yeah. this much energy into it. Yeah. And so the whole thing what we're really talking about here is customer loyalty yeah. and, you know, building a brand one person at a time. And this is something that I think, you know, we've gotten carried away with technology to the point that we have forgotten some of these soft skills yes. that really make people loyal to their brand. Yeah. So we're trying to bring that back. Amazing. And, and, and that's what people buy into. There's a, there's a great saying out there, isn't it? I, I, I don't know who coined it. Uh, and uh, I would give, give credit if I could remember. But uh, people you know, buy from people they know, like, and trust. And it's that personal sure. type of yes. sort of feeling. Yes, and so uh, slightly off script, and I'm conscious of time, guys, but how did you recruit the barefooters? That's just popped into my head. Did, was it like a customer who give a rave review and then you said, hey, do you want to become a brand ambassador? Was it like you say, this, the social enterprises that you were supporting, who you, you nominated somebody in there? Tell us how you sort of classified them. Did they meet the culture? Did they have to pass a test or were they volunteers? How did that work? Well, starting off with hiring the sales reps that worked yeah. for us, we would ask the retailers who was the best uh, sales rep that they knew of that maybe was working for the distributors or yeah. was working for another brand or something like this, who was giving the retailers the best service. And if we could hire that person, well, then that retailer was particularly appreciative yeah. and we'd already gotten good recommendations. Brilliant. Now, let's take that a little further. So we'd interview them on the phone. Now you understand that they'd work throughout the United States yeah. and our sales, uh, our, our entire sales staff would interview them on the phone. Right. And if they passed that, then we'd fly them into Northern California where our offices were. And then they would go through, well, first of all, they'd spend a night at our house yeah. when they came in. <laughs> And we would give them a nice dinner here at our home and as much wine as they <laughs> wanted to drink. Because when you're working for a winery, you're going to have as much wine as you want to drink. <laughs> so we're going to understand how they handle that. The next day they go to our offices and they talk with every person in our office about what that person does and how they work together with all of our sales team and what would be expected. So they, all of our office staff gets a feedback. Yep. Then we kind of all get together and talk about uh, if this person is a good fit. So everyone was involved in the hiring process Amazing. of the salespeople. And it wasn't that much different for people that were working in the office. Yeah. So we all had a say, we were always a team that worked together. So it's like an immersive situation, you know, like, like you see, you've got the founders, you get to meet them socially and personally, so there's no hierarchical, you know, the, the board or the CEO or whatever, or, you know, is away, it's really brought in, I suppose, you know, you know, you're assessing their characters and culture fits and things like that, but I love the fact how you bring the team in and, and you know, you meet them, and I suppose... Am I right in saying that, you know, not, I'm sure there were some who maybe fell through the cracks, but in the most, 
I'm sure that most people then wanted to work for you. you. You created that sort of foaming at the mouth. I want to work for this company. That's like the culture that people want to buy into. Was that the case in the, most, in, in the majority? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, but the biggest problem is it's, it's like they say uh, in The Music Man, you remember the opening scene, they sing that song, you got to know the territory, right? <laughs> so it didn't matter how much they wanted to work for us. It, we had people actually from Europe who wanted to work for us, and we couldn't hire them because every state in the United States has different liquor laws. <laughs> and they had to know the territory here. And we have one guy who's a friend of ours from Hamburg. Uh, he, he wanted to work for us, and we said, we love you, Frank. Uh, we want to work with you, but you can't work here because you just don't understand our laws. Yes. And so he just became our best friend. Yeah, instead. yeah he became our best friend. But, but anyway, but we couldn't work with him. But anyway, getting back, I think the biggest problem that companies have is hiring people. You know, it's ultimately it's a leap of faith. But you want to make sure that your whole staff is out there on that same limb with you if you're going to cut the branch off. You don't want anybody on staff saying, you know, I never liked that guy from the beginning or I told you so. Uh, you don't want to do that. And you don't want to cram somebody down everybody's throat because they'll tend to sabotage them if they don't like them. So it's more like you're joining our family. Yes. And, of course, going through a process like we put them through gave them a great orientation. You know, we like to say, you know, when the cement is wet, you can move it with a trowel. But when it gets hard, you need a jackhammer. Well, the cement is wet on the first day. The person comes to the offices and they meet these people and they're real human beings. And uh, this gets into the two division company and they're all committed to supporting sales because they know where their check comes from. That's amazing. That's brilliant. I love the fact of how much time you took out and to immerse them into that area and no surprise with the end result. It's, it's phenomenal. Um, as we wrap out of the show, guys, as we come into the end, uh, that's so much fun. Uh, but sh as we talk about sharing business principles, you know, through story, the advantages of the business audio theater over narration. I know we touched on it at the beginning in the bio section, but I really want to revisit that and, you know, just really get you guys to talk to me a little bit more about that um, and just share some thoughts, please. Well, um, I'll start off if that's okay, oh, yeah. Bonnie. Yes. Um, we wanted to uh, create uh, uh, an experiential learning situation. Now, if somebody says, Jim walked into the office and pulled up a chair, your brain searches your memory for a picture of an office. Your brain searches your memory for a picture of a chair. And in your mind's eye, you've helped create that scene. Yeah. Yeah. So the beauty of audio is that it, involves the listener in the learning process. Now, when you remember things, you smell a pomeria and you go, well, that reminds me of Hawaii, or you know, somebody fires up a cigar and it reminds you of your Uncle Tim. Uh, we all remember things with these touchstones that we have. Yes. So we tag, as we say now in technology, we tag memories with real things. And so, we really like the idea of layering in these kinds of suggestions in the scene descriptions. Yeah. And then when the characters come in, you identify with the characters. You say, oh, that's Bonnie's character. I know how she is. I know what her personality is by chapter two. I know how she's going to react to this. She's going to say, are you crazy? We can't do this. This is nuts, right? It's like Wallace and Gromit. You know what <laughs> say right and so that is what engages the listener so we're really keen on this idea uh and, and and for another reason you know what's the value of having the people who work in your company really know how you got there yeah. and all the pain that you went through what's the value of having your receptionist and everybody who deals with the public really understand your company's history so we're very excited to be able to offer this new form of business communication to companies and to leaders to get their ideas and principles across in a way that isn't just a prescriptive text. Yeah. You know, it's not, here's the three things you got to do, the five things to never do, yeah. the 20 things your company wants from you. 
That's not it. It's more like, here's a story, you draw your own conclusions, right? And uh, if people really appreciate that, I think, and they like to be entertained. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's amazing. And, and, you know, from your side, Bonnie, what, you, know, I, you know, obviously, Michael, that's amazing sort of input and description. Um, give us your take on it as well and just sort of uh, fill in the gaps or add some more in there and, and tell us what you see with these companies when you, you know, the output, when they see these stories. And, you know, I, I know Michael then said, form your own conclusion, but what are you seeing from the people who are engaging with this type of stuff? Well, when we produced our own audiobook from the Barefoot Spirit paperback, yeah. we knew that we had an excellent story to tell. Yep. And by going through the process of working with a director, producer, the actors, and we saw it come to life, and we heard other feedback from people that were listening to the snippets as <clears throat> as we're listening to today, it was very rewarding because people were excited about hearing it and it helps them learn more. Now, everybody has a story to tell, right? And now that we have the production team, and the actors and the process, we know how to do it. We can help other people tell Keep their story in a way that will be memorable. Yeah, and it's, and it's just amplified up, like you say. It becomes, I'm not saying that bios about companies and core values and cultures aren't, but it becomes real. You know, I, you, know you could probably, I, I can't wait to see the video playback. I'm probably chuckling away when I'm listening to Dawn and, and the, you, you know, the chalkboard and, and things like that. And then the party scene, guys, you, you feel like you're there. I feel as I'm there. You know, like with the party scene, I thought I was the guy on the phone. That's how real <laughs> it felt coming back. You know, hey, barefoot guys on the phone. You know, and I'm thinking, like, I'm the barefoot guy. I felt like I was the salesperson there. Um, with Dawn, I felt like I was a fly on the wall. And I don't know if this is right, Michael, and maybe you can share a few little secrets here. But I get the idea that I imagine this, like, warehouse with lots of pallet racking in there. And there's, like, a little office in the corner and, you know, an old kettle or tea mug or coffee mug on there. And Dawn sat there, grumpy as hell, in this old wooden desk. And that's how I would got visual. And, you know, maybe this old sort of rug carpet in there. And I don't know if it was smoking away, but I'd got, I'd got Dawn down. As that. Maybe I've got the guy totally wrong. Uh, and, and whatever. No, no, you got him right. <laughs> that's totally right. And that's that's what I'm visualizing. <laughs> See, see, the thing is that people have this popular misconception that the wine business is all about, you know, sniff, swirl, sniff, you know, say a few words in French, talk about mid-notes, forget about it. It's really about warehouses and dirty little offices and back rooms because it's a physical product. Yeah. And so you've got to get in there and wrestle with it. We're talking trucks and all this stuff. So we wanted to build that image because yeah. uh, there's, there's so many layers of information uh, in an audio script, if it's done right, to communicate a real picture of reality like, oh, my God, this is the wine business? You know, mm -hmm. I had no idea. But then as you start thinking about it, you go, you know what? These guys could have been selling hammers. <laughs> but it's right. And I never had him as, you know, the corporate, you know, uh, guy in the, the high rise with the glass front. That's how I saw him. And I'm glad I'm close to him and uh, or close-ish with the thing. But, but I think that's the power for the listeners here. Um, with the audio sort of theatre, you can see the power. Whether I got done 100% right, half right, or somewhere in the middle, uh, it doesn't matter, but you can see the power we're talking about. It's engaging conversation. Would you want to work for a company like that who's going to share that story? Do you want to be part of that? You're going to go and tell your wife, your husband, you know, your family members, they're all going to be buying it. And what's that going to do? They're going to buy the product, they're going to engage in it, they're going to support you in your working environment. So it's a phenomenal way. And, you know, having studied company culture for many years, Jim Collins, good to great, you know, Beyond Entrepreneurship is a couple of books by Jim that I, I like to read and, and, and understand. Uh, but I've never really sort of seen it put in this way. And I know you guys will say it's more or less than just culture. But to me, it's all about that feeling. It's all about that happy place. And, you know, I know Simon Sinek talks about he wants to get up and, and you know, be the best at work and, and deliver. But this to me is up there with those sort of analogies because if I can get that story of that company, you know, my customers are going to feel it, my staff's going to feel it, you know, they're motivated and, you know, 
the, I think the end result is, is, is the success that you've had. So, you know, phenomenal with it. And so if people want to get involved with the audio theater and things like that, is, is that, they just go to the page, is it guys? And can they, can they book and make an inquiry on that? Is there an extra link we can put on there? Or is it, do you want me to just push them out to that particular page of the barefoot, uh, you know, uh, audio uh, page, w w you know, uh, barefootaudiobook.com. How can they get involved if they want to do more of that with you? Well, if they go to www.barefootaudiobook.com, uh, yeah. they're going to see some free snippets that they can listen to. They can listen to some of these snippets we've listened today uh, and others, and then they can decide whether or not they want to hear the rest of the book. Yeah. Uh, we also uh, have a, a very popular uh, web page called uh, thebarefootspirit.com. Okay. And, of course, that's our name, The Barefoot Spirit. Yeah. It's spirit behind the barefoot brand uh, and it's the spirit that you could have behind your brand uh, and we talk a lot about what are the practical elements of principles like put yourself in the other guy's shoes well, what does that mean practically you know yeah. when you meet somebody and they want to do something with you what does that mean so we spell it all out but yes they can they can engage with us on social uh mm -hmm. you know we speak all over the world uh there's hundreds of articles that they can get and if they want to they can actually sign up for uh our newsletter and uh every week they'll receive uh, two or three articles that we've written yeah. um, and they can respond to those they can ask us questions a lot of the articles we write are based on the questions that we get from our following. Perfect. So ask us anything, you know, it doesn't matter. Stupid question. There's no stupid questions. <laughs> no, but if someone right. wants an audio book for themselves about their business, about family history or anything like that, they can contact us on the barefootspirit.com yep. and leave a message and we'll get in touch with them and we can pursue this and see if, if we can help bring their, their story to life. That's amazing. And for those listening on the, the apps, if you're driving your car, you're in the gym, you're out doing a jog, doesn't really matter. Uh, if you head over to blog.thesuccessup.io forward slash podcast, uh, you will be able to uh, not only watch the videos and, 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 and this podcast, but also all the links on there in the app, Stitcher, Acast, TuneIn, Google, Apple. We'll put all these links into Michael and Bonnie's pages there as well. So uh, you can get them on the move as well. Um, Bonnie, Michael, I have to say this has been one of the ultimate podcast I've ever had the privilege to host. Um, I'm truly honored that you've given me over an hour of your time. I, I, I cannot thank you enough. I'm sure the audience has had a tremendous amount of value. Um, if I could ask you guys, um, you know, as, as entrepreneurs out there making his way, you mentioned earlier about short, not shortcutting, but uh, stopping them to, you know, make some of the, you know, uh, issues and, and obstacles that you face. What would three pro tips be that you'd say to somebody out there, maybe embarking on a similar journey? Could and I know it's it, it's probably an insult to say could we compress everything down into three short clips, but from a synopsis, what would the be in your eyes if we could you know entrepreneurship? You want to be successful, take it down to three short clips or pro tips. What would you think? That, you know, I'm sorry to put you on the spot there, but what do you think those would be? Well, I think one of the most important things is to make friends with people in low places. <laughs> make friends and ask questions of everyone that might be touching your product or using yeah. your service and find out their take on it. So yeah. certainly you can go to the top people uh, and get their take, but oftentimes they're relying on other people that are doing more of the work below them to give them information. So go right to the source of that information. As you're designing your product or your service, find out what everybody along the distribution line thinks about how they relate to your product within their own business. Brilliant. That's so fantastic. make friends with people in low places. That's it. <laughs> yeah, I would say that the second one is uh, learn learn to apologize locally okay so in other words start small mm -hmm. yep. make your mistakes in a small place we started with 10 customers and yeah. we serviced the heck out of them 
we didn't know we had to service the heck out of them because, because all of a sudden they weren't reordering and we went, why aren't you reordering? And then, oh, the price is wrong. Oh, it wasn't delivered or this or that. So the thing is, you've got to really learn your business. You think you know your business, but until you go out there and start making sales and don't listen to those VCs about scale fast, fail fast. How about this? Scale slow and win the day. Yeah. So that's my second piece of advice. No, that's amazing. And I think the third piece is really the, the basis of the barefoot spirit, yeah. which is put yourself in the other guy's shoes. Yeah. Stand in their shoes, in their position, and see the situation from, from their viewpoint. Uh, everyone wants something different. Everyone has a different challenge. And the better that you can understand their challenges and their needs and help them achieve their goals, the more they'll be interested in what it is that you're selling to them. If they're yeah. touching it and they have to do something with it, you have to sell them on your product. You can only do that by satisfying their needs. So put yeah. yourself in the other guy's shoes. And that's from the, the top to the bottom. Well, then all the distribution line right down to the end user. Yeah, that's great advice. And, you know, again, if, you, if you're listening out there, hit the rewind button and just pick out those three points. You know, speak to people in low places, you know, follow that chain, you know, and, uh, you know, boss, boss your service locally and, and, and start small and scale and service the heck out of them. And then, like you say, using the barefoot spirit there, uh, you know, walk a mile in their shoes and, and yes. you know, you're really going to be inside your, you know, your customer. You know, but, and it, you know I'm sure you learn something along the way product development maybe it stops you going down a cul-de-sac and you know losing because it's not just about the lost money sometimes audience it can be about the lost product it lost lost opportunity could you have been doing something else you know you may have missed a time window of opportunity if you've gone down a cul-de-sac there's all these things and sometimes you know if you get all of it understand that those three pieces of advice are absolute gold thank you very much indeed i really appreciate you sharing that with the audience today well, this has been our pleasure. We really enjoyed this, Mike. Thank you. No, it's, it, the, trust me, the pleasure is all mine, and I'm grinning from ear and ear. It, it's, it's approaching close of business here on a Friday in the UK. I know it's just getting started for you out in, in, in California, uh, but I'm going to go into the weekend with a big smile on my face. I cannot wait to put this out uh, and share your wisdom uh, with my audience. Uh, we'll be doing some pre-show uh, pre, um, uh, promotions as well. Uh, if you want to check out um, uh, Bonnie and Michael, as I say, I'll put all the show links in the app and online, but head over to uh, barefootspirit.com. Get started there uh, and you can get going from there. Bonnie, Michael, it's been an absolute honor and pleasure to interview you today. Thank you so much for putting so much value. It, it, it's been amazing. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mike. Thanks, it's, it's, Mike. It's, it's been fun. <laughs> That's great. And for us listeners, you know, we hope you've had some value. You're learning from two absolute global um, legends that I would say, um, you know, from remember right at the beginning from Laundry Room through to the largest wine brand in the world and they've come to you with some amazing sort of service and, and strategies in the, in the business and, and the support that they've done. And we appreciate you tuning in and taking, to, you know, day, you know, time out of your own day today. Uh, I hope it's been worth it. And as always, we appreciate you continuing your growth engine development to get in the game, go and do the hustle, go make it happen. And we're going to see you on another Open Mic podcast show real, real soon. Take care. Have a great week. have been listening to the open mic brought to you by the success hub to find out more and to get the resources we have mentioned in this podcast episode simply visit blog.thesuccesshub.io and view the podcast section thanks for listening and we look forward to catching up with you in our next episode This podcast and associated materials is published under copyright to the Success Hub. All rights reserved. No reproduction of this material is permitted.